been extremely different had I uh, been um, undocumented at the time of arrival um, or been in this kind of situation. And I think that, you know, it's important that we realize that it's not enough to just say, do your best, uh, try your best in school and everything will be fine because many of the students who are uh, DACA students have done their best. They've done well in school. They've Some students may not even realize until they're actually going to college that there's an issue with regard to their immigration status. Um, and so I, I think it's important that we provide support, that we provide resources, but that we also take action. I think it's not enough for us to sit back and say, oh, glad that didn't happen to me or that's really unfortunate. And but that we come together as a community um, to be able to take action where we can to uh, write our uh, congressional representatives and let them know of our support for this uh, student group because we know that um, they contribute so much to the economy, so much to the country. Uh, and so I just want to again thank everyone who was um, working to put this event together today. Uh, I thank you uh, um, for being here um, and uh, look forward to hearing what we have to say. So thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Dr. Boykin. So we're going to get right into our presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. <laughs> Thank you, Suetonia. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, excellent observations because uh, we feel the same way. And, uh, you know, we've been doing DACA cases for um, quite some time, actually, when DACA came online back in... Eight uh, years. Well, wow. yeah, back in 2012. Um, you know, we always felt so strongly about what major contributions the, the, the Dockians uh, were making. And um, if Dockians is a word. And, uh, um, and, and then obviously uh, we were quite disheartened when, um, you know, we went into a little bit of a tailspin in 2017 when it was taken offline, or at least partially, where we couldn't do any new ones. And we were only doing extensions, um, so that was a that was a little difficult for us. But um, what we'd like to do today, um, maybe we'll go to the uh, first slide there, and um, you know our our goals here are to tell you a little bit about the background of DACA and maybe the history of DACA, to bring you up to speed on the uh, DACA rescission and when that happened, what was entailed by that uh, rescission. And then obviously that culminated in, a, um, in an argument before the Supreme Court back in November of 2019. And then just last week, uh, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, it seems like last week, uh, just two weeks ago, the US Supreme Court pronounced uh, their determination with regard to those cases that were consolidated before them. And then uh, we wanna let your folks know, you know, where do we go from here? Um, that's a really interesting question that everyone has, and probably a, a lot of the gray area. You know, where do we go from here? What's, uh, what, what's the next step, if any? Um, and then, of course, uh, this is something which I think we've uh, actually, at the request of uh, Corey Spring, at uh, your organization uh, in the past, we've actually made presentations about DACA and talked about alternatives to DACA. What else is out there and what other things should be considered? And, um, you know, DACA for a lot of folks uh, is, uh, might lull people into complacency because they say, okay, well, I got DACA, got my work authorization, I'm good. But, you know, um, what else is out there is really and, good. And now is more, it's, it's really time to do something and just change the status to a more permanent status. So now more than ever. Exactly. Uh, so I think that's gonna be important discussion about what are the alternatives. Exactly, and then we'll say, and then we'll take some questions. Um, so that's the um, that's the uh, the way we think the uh, the webinar is going to go. So that's our roadmap. So I guess what we'll do is we'll start a little bit with uh, the history of DACA, and um, you know, tell you a little bit about. I'm actually going to go back way before 2012, um, but I'm going to come up to this slide. Um, so uh, actually, back in 2001. Uh, was when uh, DACA or uh, the Dreamers became a word. And that was when um, uh, Durbin and Hatch um, actually proposed before Congress what's called the DREAM Act. And the DREAM Act stands for the Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act. 
That was the DREAM Act. And what it did was at the time, it provided a pathway for individuals who were in the United States who didn't have uh, status, who really um, were brought here as, um, you know, they, they didn't really uh, know that they didn't have status until all of a sudden questions came up when they enrolled in college. What is your social security number and what is your status? And so all of a sudden, uh, you know, so, so what happened was um, dreamers came online, if you will, in 2001 and became a thing. And um, then what happened was over the years, and it was actually over a 10 year period, there was a grassroots uh, lobby, if you will, that started to gain a lot of uh, interest. And it went all the way up through 2010, immigrate, immigrant rights organizations uh, took on this concept of uh, getting some type of uh, benefit for, uh, for individuals who were in the United States who had this form of status. And it was actually almost tantamount or uh, equivalent to what was going on in the LGBTY uh, area where uh, Dockians had the sense of coming out, if you will. And if you recall, that was also sort of about the time under Obama where uh, that's exactly what happened is that there were certain uh, rights that were given to the LGBTY community. And then all of a sudden in 2012, um, and I remember it vividly uh, when, because uh, uh, I was actually at an American Immigration Lawyers Association conference and um, the president, they, they announced that the president was going to come out and make some kind of a big announcement. And he went into the Rose Garden and he announced that uh, DACA was going to be a thing. Um, and uh, that was uh, what we refer to as an executive action. And it's kind of interesting because um, a lot of folks ask us, like, you know, uh, what is DACA? And um, it's, it's really, I think, important to understand where DACA has its uh, roots from a legal perspective. And so um, back in the day, back in uh, Two th or I would say mid to probably 2004, 2005, there were these memoranda that were going around internally at the uh, USCIS at the time. And um, there, there was uh, Julie Myers was actually in charge of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Division. And there was this memo that she put out on what was called deferred action. And what they did is they set up priorities where certain people were gonna be, uh, they were setting up priorities for removal and uh, individuals who were uh, convicted of crimes, bad crimes, were a removal uh, 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 priority. And so there was a memorandum which basically set up, these are the people who we want removed. And one of the folks actually, one group of folks who was listed on that memo were, were Dockians or people who were brought to the United States. Um, and, and what happened was over time, these were not considered to be priority. So on their list, um, they actually took a position and said, this is not a removal priority. Now, I don't know if many people know this, but actually President Obama was um, responsible for actually deporting a lot of people at the time. So um, I think that that was obviously a little political because um, he had to take actions on both sides, which I guess any good politician would do. And so he was um, known for being the deporter in chief, but at the same time, he went into the Rose Garden uh, in 2012, it was actually in June of 2012, and announced the implementation of DACA, which later took the, uh, it was later uh, memorialized in a memorandum, which was put out by uh, Janet Napolitano. Um, and Janet Napolitano, for those of you who may not know, she was in charge of the uh, Department of Homeland Security, later to become in charge of the, um, uh, she's now, I think, in charge of the uh, schools, uh, the University of California uh, uh, division over there. It's actually all of the schools in, um, in uh, a part of the uh, state of California um, network. Um, so, so this, uh, this DACA concept took its form in this memorandum that um, Janet Napolitano uh, put out. As a prosecutorial discretion. As a form, exactly, as a yeah. form of prosecutorial discretion. And it's, it's important to understand that it emanates from a concept of prosecutorial discretion, which is really something that came under fire 
uh, or continues to come under fire as to whether or not it was permissible to do this type of thing because it was prosecutorial discretion. Is the executive, uh, is the executive allowed to just go ahead and do this? So uh, what's interesting is, from a, again, from a historical perspective, uh, we've always had something called deferred action. That's and been prosecutorial called. discretion, it's, it's very old. Exactly. We've been and using it for years. Even before DACA actually came online, actually yeah. before DREAMers were even suggested, it was this concept of deferred action, which is an application that Ludga and I can make directly to the district director's office, um, you know, uh, either in New York or New Jersey, if there's an individual who has certain equities and uh, we have to prove those equities and, uh, and we make that application directly to USCIS and they have the discretion to grant deferred action or uh, to defer the removal of that individual. So it is not, a, just to, so you understand, it's not a lawful status, is just exactly as you mentioned, it's just deferral of a deportation. So it's definitely not a legal status. Exactly, and, and also I think it's important to point out that it's not and was not created, and I think intentionally so, because the Dreamer, the original Dreamer Act was a pathway to uh, citizenship or a pathway to a green card and then to citizenship, whereas DACA was intentionally created not to be a pathway to citizenship. And it was done politically, I think, you know, just to take a step back, politically it was done that way because I think that was the way they were hoping that it would gain favor because these individuals, and this is, this is sort of the, uh, it didn't meet a tremendous amount of resistance at the time, because if the individuals don't have a pathway to become citizens, then they can't vote. So they then this, this way, the Republicans can't really fear or shouldn't fear that type of program, okay? Whereas with the Dreamer Act, of course, which was originally back in 2001, that did have a pathway, and that's why it was, you know, pardon the expression, DOA, dead on arrival, because there was no way that that was going to go through, because that would have provided the pathway for those individuals to be able to vote. So that's, uh, so then, okay, so, so, uh, so DACA was put into the law. So what, what exactly does DACA provide? Lutka, what, what exactly are the requirements that need to be met under the DACA program as it was originally implemented um, back in 2000. Yeah. So the individual had to come to the United States before the age of 16. And very important is that they lived in the United States since 2007. So they wanted five years, but obviously by now it would be longer than five years. We also had to show physical presence on June 15, 2012. And of course, they couldn't leave and just live outside of the United States because I have some of the clients. They have to continue living in United States. If they have advanced parole, they can travel, uh, those that were able to get it um, previously. But otherwise, they have to be here up until now. Plus, um, either they are in high school or they already have diploma or they have GED. And of course, the most important no criminal convictions. So there has been a lot of discussions about it because you would think uh, of some type of serious criminal uh, offense, but um, DUI is a problematic. Uh, so driving under influence would be problematic. Any type of domestic violence would be problematic. Of course, anything yeah. with drugs <laughs> would be problematic. So, you know, that's, there has been a lot of discussions on what the serious misdemeanor is. And, you know, I think um, it was very concerning that DUI is considered a serious misdemeanor. So that would disqualify people from applying for DACA. Well, Ludka, remember when uh, DACA came online, I, re I recall that you and I had numerous discussions because we were completely confused because we didn't know what a serious misdemeanor was. Yeah, so they like they actually were David denying. If you remember, they were denying cases um, initially just by looking at the documents. They would deny. Then there was um, later on. I cannot remember if it was the same year. There was an actual definition. So now we have a definition what the serious misdemeanor is. So again, you know, it's. Um, domestic violence, 
um, DUI, or if there is any sentence, you know, that person has to serve for more than 90 days. Right. So basically what DACA did is, at least in the immigration world, uh, of what we call crimigation, is it rewrote the, uh, it rewrote yes. the crimigation law to include now this concept of serious misdemeanor, which we didn't have before DACA was passed. Uh, Ludke, I want to go back to something you mentioned, advanced parole. Are you mm-hmm. saying that DACAans are allowed to travel? So, or, yeah. Mm-hmm. At the time, so in 2012, 2013, we were filing uh, advan- application for advanced parole that would allow them to travel, which is very significant or was very significant because right now you really cannot do that. You cannot apply for advanced parole. But uh, for those that entered without inspection, if they got advanced parole, they left and they came back to the United States, they would be admitted. So they were able to file for a green card. I think we are going to discuss it, the matter of uh, Arabelli, Arabelli. Okay, great. So um, actually, so what would happen, and I think it's important just to mention so that the folks who are on the webinar understand that this is not yet, uh, we're not there yet with the new rules. No. But it's something that we're keeping a very close eye on because we want to know whether or not individuals will be able to take advantage of this again because okay, this yeah. is one of the ways in which they can get on the pathway yes. potentially to get to the green card and rectifying their status. Because if they leave the United States without, let's say they enter without inspection, they get a travel document and they leave the country. When they come back in, what's their status? They're parolees. Parolee, right? they're inspected, which is very important for apply- when you're applying for the green card. Exactly, which allows them then to apply for the green card in the United States. So that's yeah. a, it's a very helpful it's a very helpful status to have. I also wanted to okay. just go back. Let's see. I wanted to go back on one other thing that we discussed here. Um, oh yes. So so what happens actually is right around right after DACA is is passed. Okay, and these are the requirements up on your screen here. There was a discussion about another program that go called DAPA. What was DAPA? Oh, wow. I I even forgot about that. That was for parents. Uh Um, That was for parents. It never happened. We were all hoping and preparing that it would happen. It had a similar requirements. They had to pay taxes and, you know, be here, I think, for five years. So unfortunately, that never happened, which, you know, is a shame. Um, I think there was even a penalty, if I remember, for not filing the taxes, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the government would make a lot of money on that. So it would make sense to do that, I, in my opinion, because they would be able to get address. They would be able to know who is in the United States without status. You know, they would basically have track. Now they, there's no way for them to track everyone who is here without status. So, you know, it's a shame that it never happened, but it, it was the same concept. It was deferred action for parents of oh, U.S. citizens. Exactly. And so... Um, so again, that was also part of this initiative, utilizing, yeah. um, utilizing deferred action as a rule. So it was sort of a, the next logical extension after, I believe it was about 650,000 uh, DACA folks applied. Then um, there was the, that initiative for DAPA. And you're absolutely right. I think that that just uh, unfortunately uh, went nowhere. So, so yeah, after- now, now, David, we have around... I think 800,000 right. Dakians, yeah. how you say it, Dakians, yeah. So that's a, you know, and they are, they are thinking that there must be way over a million. So I still have clients, we have clients that missed it. Somehow they never heard of DACA. They could have applied, but they didn't. So now in, in this moment, this is very important what's going to happen because obviously if they can file as a first time Dakians, that would be excellent life-changing for them. Exactly. So, so where's the turmoil? The turmoil is in that all of a sudden in August of 2017, there was a meeting. And so, so obviously DACA's, um, DACA's implemented in 2012 and mm-hmm. things are moving along nice and comfortably. And then all of a sudden in August of 2017, there's a meeting that's called at the White House with Sessions, Miller, and Kelly Okay, and um, they did it when Kushner was out of town because <laughs> he's 
on the immigration. And what happened was at that meeting, a determination was made that DACA was going to be terminated. And essentially it was a, you know, it, it comes to be like a unilateral determination by Sessions. Uh, Sessions was never a, uh, a big proponent and he always said that uh, DACA's implementation was, uh, was illegal. So there was this memorandum that, was, uh, that came down and um, that was, I believe uh, the date that we have on there is uh, September 5th yeah. when the memo came down. And yeah. uh, that was actually um, a Duke. Terminating the yeah, 2012 was, memo. Yep, that was Duke mm -hmm. who signed that memorandum. And then um, as she actually uh, later left. Uh, she was fired and then Nielsen took over. So, um, but basically what that did was it provided a, a short window of opportunity in which applications could be made. And, um, and also there was right at that point, uh, there was an implementation of uh, litigation. There were, and there were actually three major cases that were filed. I don't have the names of the specific cases, but they're, uh, maybe they're on the next slide. Um, yeah. So, um, so the, uh, what happened was that uh, they, they filed these uh, injunctions. One of these litigations, um, one of these litigations implemented a restraining order against DACA, which permitted us to continue to file DACA extensions, but we were not allowed to file new DACA applications and we were not allowed to file um, advanced parole travel documents. And that's DACA. where we where we still are right now. Right, but but I think that, uh, so, so what we wanna do is we wanna come up to um, the, so, so obviously it was in litigation since, um, so, you know, so th this was uh, in litigation until November of 2019, when they went in front of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and made the arguments. And uh, again, just two weeks ago, we got the determination um, as to, uh, you know, what the, so uh, basically it was a, a win for us on June 18th. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, the termination of deferred action violated the law. So um, the major holding in the case is that um, it was a violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. So, um, and basically they didn't address whether it's a viable program. So, so they, basically they said that the way it was terminated was illegal. was illegal, exactly. So they can just come back and terminate it properly. Exactly. That's what could happen. Exactly, and that's, um, that's sort of what we're anticipating given the rhetoric that we've been hearing after the Supreme Court decision came down because there was some really, uh, what I refer to as nasty language from the US Department yeah. of Homeland Security and from the USCIS where they felt that the Supreme Court did not do its job and did not make the right decision. Um, so, but I think that- So they're, yeah, they're still not accepting new applications. I think there were several attorneys um, in our community that tried to file new uh, DACA applications uh, right after June 18th. But unfortunately, because USCIS, you know, they didn't come down with any type of um, instructions, they are rejecting those applications. So they are definitely not uh, taking any new DACA applications at this time, just the renewals. Exactly. And so, it, and it's, so it's kind of interesting because um, number one, the APA was at issue in the decision. Yeah. Uh, number two was there's this uh, really important concept that the Supreme Court justices addressed, which is called forbearance. And that was that great emphasis was placed on the fact that over 650,000 plus individuals, so again, like Luke just said, probably closer to 800,000 individuals are Dockians and have relied upon this benefit that's been granted to them by the US federal government. And for that to be immediately terminated would not be, uh, would not be uh, uh, conscionable. And uh, they actually referred to it as um, that the determination uh, to, uh, to take it offline immediately would be arbitrary and capricious. So those are the, the legal terms that they referred to. There was one very interesting dissent by uh, Santa Mayor, 
uh, who there was an issue in the case as to whether or not uh, the taking of DACA or the, uh, the attempt to take DACA offline had any racial animus to it. And um, all of the judges, uh, with the exception of Santamayor, said that there was no racial animus. However, um, Judge Santamayor said uh, that there was in fact um, and could be racial animus associated with it. So um, that was uh, kind of an interesting. So, so that's where the decision uh, is now. And um, so now what is, what is the ripple effect of that determination and where do we go from here is really the big question. So many of you may have already been on other webinars and you've probably heard a great deal of um, uh, banter back and forth at this point as to what people are thinking about what's going on. But I think that, uh, you know, we obviously have our personal opinion uh, within our firm and how we are advising our clients. So I think, uh, Ludka, maybe we want to just focus a little bit on that and tell the, uh, the attendees on this webinar, you know, what, what are we saying to our clients about DACA and how to proceed? So for any new DACAs, those that have never filed DACA application, we are advising them to just wait until, you know, we have more information from the USCIS. Um, I mean, we, you know, some, as I said, some attorneys are filing, but they are rejecting those applications. So probably it's the best to um, wait. And, you know, another important aspect is, you know, for some people, it, it may be, especially those that are in removal, that have removal order, for example, if you do apply, you're kind of putting yourself out there, they're going to have your information, and we are not quite sure what they're going to do with that information. So that's just something to think about when deciding whether or not to file the application. But at this point, we, are, we kind of put it on hold until we know what's going on with USCIS. So yesterday, Luke, you and I kicked around a little bit about, you know, what to do and why. And one of the things we talked about was the fact that when the original DACA was put out there, that was a really big concern by people. They were always saying to us, well, you know, if I'm not here, if I'm here and I'm not in status and I put my information out there on an application, could the government turn around and use that information against me and remove me? Now, we know from the original DACA implementation that they had a policy that was embedded in that memorandum that specifically gave a safe harbor to individuals to say, don't worry, even if you apply for DACA, we're not going to remove you, right? So yeah. do, do we have that safe harbor here after the uh, Supreme Court decision? Um, I don't think so. No, we don't. So, so yeah. but that would be something if we had that safe harbor and we knew that our clients could be safe, and know that the information is not going to be used by the government against them, I think I would feel a little more comfortable with them applying afresh. For yeah, them. definitely. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. So, um, so what else to our, um, okay. Yeah, I think we covered it. Okay, good. So it's, uh, we are anticipating right now, given that, um, thank you for getting that slide. We are anticipating now that there will definitely be further guidance. Um, we don't know whether it's gonna be in the form of a memorandum uh, or field guidance, adjudicator's guidance. We're just not sure how it's gonna come out. We're not sure if it's gonna come out. Again, because of the nasty language that we heard from USCIS, it could potentially be that we may see a rulemaking process initiated where the US Department of, uh, sorry, the USCIS may uh, try to implement a regulation which takes DACA offline and that would be through the formal rulemaking process where the public would be given a certain period of time in which to respond to that rule. Now, um, I think it probably is important for us to point out because, it's, and also obvious, that um, we're in an election year. So how interesting, right? That the number one, that the Supreme Court waited as, as long as they did to give a decision. The case was argued in November of 2019, and yet the, the decision on that case is only, uh, is only issued two weeks ago, right? So you, you, know, you gotta wonder whether uh, things uh, are politically motivated in a way. Uh, so, 
it's kind of interesting that it comes down when it does, because even if it would seem to me, even if they took steps to try to take this offline, I don't think they can do it before November. Uh, yeah. So, so it seems to me that DACA continues, um, at least, uh, at least it persists as a viable uh, benefit past uh, November of 2020. Okay, so Ludka, um, what options or alternatives exist to DACA? What, what other things should folks be looking at as possible, um, uh, we call what, workarounds? So one of the first things that we would um, explore um, with um, DACA applicants is the 245I. And uh, I can guarantee you that they will not know what it is. Like whenever I ask, I think just this morning I was asking, you know, if are you protected under 245I? So because this is really old, it's from um, 2001, they wouldn't necessarily know. But, you know, that's one of the th very important things because we still find cases even now where maybe their parents are protected on the law, um, 245i, which means that either their parents or uh, some type of relative filed petition for them before April 30th, 2001, or maybe parents, employer filed something. So they, Dakians typically do not know about it. So what does it mean? Um, example, we have somebody with DACA, uh, they have employment authorization card and they're working. Um, and the employer says, well, I want to help, I want to help you, um, you know, talk to the lawyer, how I can help you. Typically, um, those that have work authorization documents, they are not able to proceed with the employment-based green card because either they entered without inspection or at some point they were out of status. However, if they're protected under 245I, um, they would be able to proceed with the green card through the employer or through the parent or through the brother or sister. You know, that's a different story if they are married to U.S. citizen. We'll discuss that later. But that's very important protection, the 245I um, protection. So, you know, our role is kind of a detective that we kind of check um, how, if the parents are here, how, they, how did they get the green card? Uh, was there any filing, qualified filing pr prior to April 30th, 2001? In some uh, cases, we do Freedom of Information Act where we get the full files from the government, either USCIS or uh, CBP or EOIR. Um, and just to determine, you know, if um, that would apply. So that's one of my favorite. Um, that's where I would start with the 245i. And I'd just like to elaborate a little bit on 245i so uh, the attendees on our webinar completely understand it. And that is that that was a, it was referred to back in the day as a limited amnesty. It wasn't really an amnesty, but it was a special program. What happened was in 1996, you may recall that Ira Ira, yeah. immigrant, uh, Illegal Immigrant uh, Reconciliation Act of 1996 really dealt some very, very hard blows to the immigrant community in the United States. There were a lot of changes that were made to the law that were not very good. The biggest one, of course, was the three and the 10-year bars, which is under 212A9, 1 and 2, where if an individual overstayed in the United States by, uh, one, by uh, 180 days, they would be barred for three years if they left because that would trigger the bar. And then if they overstayed by one full year, they would be barred for, um, so ten they, they were for 10 years, right, exactly. So those bars were a form of self deportation or self removal. So Clinton gave up the immigration law essentially to the Republicans back in 1996 and the Republicans wrought havoc with it and I think that what happened was he wanted to get back the Hispanic vote in 2001. And so what he did was he started in 1997 and implemented what was called the LIFE Act. And it started in 1997. It was finally culminated in 2001. But basically what it is, and Lutka said it, was that if there was a qualified filing that was done prior to April 30th of uh, 2001, okay, then what happens is that, and what is a qualified filing? 
an I-130, an I-140, an I-485. For um, Department of Labor's. Um, or a labor certification application yeah. or, or an asylum application. So if you made an application that was a qualifying application prior to April 30th of 2001, you were able to uh, pay a penalty, stay in the United States and adjust your status without having to worry about the three and 10 year bars. So that was, if you will, uh, President Clinton's quick fix to be able to get the Hispanic vote back that he lost in 1996 as a result of giving up the immigration issue. Now, chances are, Today, if we look at these documents, right, Lutka? They wouldn't. I was going to say, it's not them because they were minors, but it's the parents. So the question we ask is the, if they have parents in the United States and they have some type of status, or even if they don't, but let's say they filed something which later got denied, it still qualifies passably. We would have to determine, um, you know, we would have to look at the documents, but it would be the parents. So our DACA applicants by now, they they were minors and that's why they would be grandfathered under the parents so that's really it makes me very happy and i still have a lot of cases that i find uh 245i because it's a nice workaround and the employer can file um green card application for the daca applicant or the parent or brother and sister um or green card holder uh spouse so we don't necessarily need to have marriage to U.S. citizen to get the green card if we have the 245i protection. Exactly. So essentially what we're talking about is the, the workaround that you're referring to, Lutka, is working around this three and 10 year bar because of the accrual of the unlawful presence. So with that being said, let's move on to waivers and let's talk about, because I know you do a lot of waivers. Yeah. <laughs> you do a lot of waivers in our office. So how does the waiver how is the waiver a workaround for the three and 10 year bar? So if 245 uh, is not available, then you know the next step would be to explore the waiver. So for example, for those that entered without inspection and they're currently here, they have DACA, I would consider provisional waiver. So it's called provisional because it doesn't really take effect until the person leaves the United States. So the nice thing is that the waiver um, is applied for in the United States, the person stays in the United States, it gets approved, and only then the person would physically have to leave the United States, go to the U.S. Embassy and get the immigrant visa. But at that point, they would have the waiver in their hand. And what is waiver? It's kind of like a pardon. Um, there has to be qualifying relative. So the qualifying relative uh, is U.S. citizen or green card holder spouse, or U.S. citizen or green card holder parent. And we have to prove extreme hardship to that qualifying relative. So the government doesn't really care what's going on with the DACA applicant, but they want to see that there is a hardship to that green card holder or U.S. citizen qualifying relative. And, you know, we explore the hardship. Either it's financial, medical, uh, the separation, uh, if there is any disability, uh, ties to the United States, if, you know, the qualifying relatives, if they have any ties abroad, um, we look at the language, career. So there are many, many different factors that we look at when we are determining whether or not there is um, hardship. Um, the standard waiver would be for any other issues. So for example, if there is a fraud, a criminal issue, well, if there is criminal issue, probably the person would not have a DACA, um, but any other inadmissibility would be under the standard uh, waiver. So as example, um, fraud. So let's say that the person entered with somebody else's passport. So that would be fraud in inadmissibility. So the provisional waiver would not work. It would have to be the normal uh, waiver, which is the same thing. Um, and if, um, if uh, I'm trying to think what other inadmissibility, criminal, uh, it could be health. So, you know, there are different waivers. Typically for Dacians, we would do provisional waiver. 
that's very typical. And that also was established in 2013. So in 2012, we started with the DACAs and then right afterwards in 2013, we were filing all of these provisional waivers for people that entered without inspection because in the past, they had to leave the United States do the waiver abroad, be stuck abroad for a year or two, or sometimes even longer, and then come back, hopefully, if the waiver gets approved. So, but it, it's really nice option um, for DACA applicants, because by filing a waiver, yes, we provide the information about them, but they already have the production and they have the um, employment authorization card. So I really like doing provisional waivers, you know, for those that have DACA. And I think it's also, uh, I think you mentioned this, but I just want to go back and highlight this for everyone who's on the webinar. And that is originally a qualifying relative was a U.S. citizen, okay, a parent or a spouse. But then that was liberalized, right? Yeah, and so, I think in 2016, yeah. if I remember correctly. Right, I think that President Obama, um, actually it was by way of also a memorandum. Um, that would... That one, I think, went through the rulemaking process, if I'm not mistaken. But, and also, it applied only to immediate relative petitions, whereas now the provisional waiver applies to any petitions. Exactly. So, so it's important to understand that you, you, know, you should think about the possibility of utilizing the waiver uh, process if it's something that you're able to do. Uh, another workaround, if I can move on to you, visas, is that? Yeah. Okay, so um, another uh, workaround is the U visa. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar with it, uh, the U visa is a non-immigrant visa classification available for individuals who are the victims of certain crimes. So um, U visas are really nice to use because uh, individuals who are in the U.S. who don't have status uh, are do not have to leave the country to be able to obtain their U visa status in the US. So the government basically gives you U visa status here in the US. But uh, what you should do is if you uh, think you might be the victim of a certain crime, uh, go online and look up U visas. Um, and there is a list of, I would say probably what, about uh, 20, 30 um, different yeah. types of crimes. Uh, in order to do a case like this, we need to have a police report, if there was uh, some type of a harm that came to you physically, we would need a hospital report. But um, we remain available sort of on a regular basis to do analyses for individuals who think they might qualify for U visas. And uh, we are familiar with what the procedures are and where that needs to be filed. I think the big downside with U visas, unfortunately, is that they the just time. take a long time. Takes a very long time, but it's a nice route to a green card. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's a nice way to a green card. Uh, parole in place. Um, is that, yeah? Yeah, parole in place is, is really good. I mean, it's also um, the person, especially for those that entered without inspection, because they are going to be, um, they're going to be getting the document, which will allow them to do uh, immediate green card. So... And this, and this has its genesis, actually, in the same sort of uh, concepts as DACA, because what happened was in those original memoranda that were put out, those priority, uh, you know, those pri uh, uh, removal priority memoranda, there was an exception that was made for military personnel and members of their family. So yeah. it's a separate benefit that you can apply for directly to, uh, you know, directly to the, uh, uh, to the district director at one of the local uh, offices. And it has been, um, it's been really effective. And also um, there are individuals who actually work at the district offices who specifically handle military personnel and their family members. So they get uh, very focused attention. So if, you know, th if this is a potential benefit for you, it's a, it's a great way to uh, take advantage. Um, let's talk a little bit about asylum, which by the way is under fire right now. Uh, because we have a new set of potential, potential new set of asylum rules that are coming out. But let's assume you have a bona fide asylum case. Um, how For example, that changed conditions. I, that's something that comes to my mind, that something has changed to the con in the country, because typically you apply for asylum within one year of entry. 
So, you know, our DAC applicants have been here for a long time. So let's say changed conditions, country conditions. Okay, so asylum is if an individual is from a particular social group, we call them PSGs, who have a credible fear of persecution of uh, returning to their home country. And so if that is you, or if there's a particular reason why you fear returning home, then you can file uh, here in the United States for asylum. Uh, you go in front of a, an asylum officer, you plea your case, and then if the officer finds that you are entitled to asylum, they can grant it. If they feel that you're not, you go in front of an immigration judge, um, you get what's called an NTA, you go in front of an immigration judge, but you get a second bite at the apple where you have an opportunity to plea certain defenses, but at the same time, you can ask for asylum again. So, um, so that's, uh, that's asylum. And then we have marriage to U.S. citizen. So for those um, that entered with inspection, um, you know, it's not a problem. They can file any time and typically they receive a green card within one year, depending on what, which state they are in. Um, the more problematic uh, ones are those that entered without inspection. Um, so they would either need a waiver, as we discussed, or, you know, here we have, it was a matter of uh, Arabelli and Yarabelli, um, where if they got advanced parole and they traveled and they re-entered and were admitted, they would be able to file marriage case or green card case through a U.S. citizen um, and they wouldn't need a waiver. So that was a really nice uh, workaround, which, you know, is not really applicable right now, but, you know, it's just nice way. So if we can file travel documents or advanced paroles uh, in the future, that would be something that we could use. Exactly. Great. So these are some of the alternatives that uh, we're looking at for our clients on a regular basis. Um, and and we have question here, David. Okay. Hold on one second. Um, if there, the government is going to terminate the DACA program properly, what that might look like? Is it possible that DACA, DACAs will find themselves in jeopardy once again? So um, that's a great question, actually. Um, thank you, Dr. Brewer, for that. That's <laughs> uh, perfect. So um, the way that it works is that um, the government is required to print in the federal register um, what, the, what the rule is going to be. And then it goes out for what's called rulemaking. Uh, so it's a normal rulemaking process. And uh, it's not clear whether it's going to be um, an interim rule, uh, whether it's going to be a final rule or whether it's going to be a proposed rule. If it's a proposed rule, I believe there's a 60 day comment period um, interim rules and final rules become um, immediate, but um, those are uh, that. That's what it looks like: is that it's proposed in the Federal Register with uh, a proper time for the public to address the issues, um, and then for the uh, I, I believe it's the Office of Management and Budget to take into account all of the comments and then to make determinations. So um, the answer is that. Uh, if the government decides that they want to go that route, um, yes, DACA could actually be in jeopardy again. Absolutely. Um, uh, David, do you think they would deport everyone who has DACA? Would they put everyone in deportation? And do, they, do the courts have resources to have everyone, 800 people, 800,000 people in removal proceedings? So, so it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Lutka. And actually, um, you know the answer to the question. <laughs> why you asked it, but um, I always tell people that, you know, uh, last numbers I looked at to remove a person from the United States is between $3,700 and $5,000 per person. So if you take that number and you multiply that by $800,000, uh, you get a very, very big number. I can't see that the federal government, especially at this time, is going to spend that kind of money to remove all of the people who, uh, you know, who, uh, have DACA. So I, I just don't think it's going to happen. And I think that also politically has a lot to do with why, um, why they waited on the decision as long as they did. And, um, you know, so I, I, I think that a lot of this is politically motivated. You know, immigration continues to be a political football. Um, I think that it's clear that it has become more of a football 
during the season when there wasn't football. <laughs> so so um, I think that uh, I, I don't think that we're going to see uh, DACA taken offline, but I can say, let me, I, I believe that if there is a rule that is proposed, I know that it's going to certainly meet with uh, strenuous opposition from grassroots organizations, um, the organizations that obviously have their genesis back in the, um, you know, uh, back in the mid 2000, uh, you know, from 2001 to 2010, these organizations have been rolling along and gathering, uh, you know, just incredible um, uh, uh, political uh, clout over time. And so I think that, um, you know, they're going to, there's going to be just tremendous, tremendous opposition. Yeah. Well, I, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Luca. No, 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 don't worry. Are there any more questions anyone has in the chat? I, David, can you see the chat? I cannot really because I have the screen I, up. I can. I just see uh, the last just one. the one. Yeah. Dr. Brewer's question. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'd like to just say that um, you know we, as a firm, uh, Lutka and I, we we have uh, by the way we have five lawyers in our office. We're all closely monitoring uh, what's going on. What's going on with DACA? I I also want to just take one detour and say there was one particular option on that last slide that we did not mention, and that is Canada is an option. And a lot of our DACA, we actually had a, a young lady who worked in our office who was a DACAian, and uh, when DACA went into a tailspin, uh, she actually moved up to Canada, which is where she is now. Um, I, I suspect that, you know, once she has her citizenship in uh, Canada, which probably is only about a year or two away, she's then going to come back down to the United States as a TN, and then slowly work her way to H-1B, and then to the green card. So which that's, you know, another option is... Or she will change her mind given that's what's going on right now with H-1Bs and F-1s and everyone. So while, you know, obviously we didn't discuss it, this is outside of the scope of this uh, presentation, but, you know, what's going on with the F-1s, right. it's, it's not good. And, you know, the only thing I want to say that schools in Canada welcome everyone. So what we may see is just everyone going to Canada, which is very unfortunate. Right. So we're, 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 you know, we, we, unfortunately, I think that our administration is not taking into account that we are going to lose the battle for the best and the brightest yeah. and other countries are going to take advantage of the worldwide brain drain. And we should be in the forefront. We yeah. should be opening our doors to the folks who are bringing value to this country by, oh, by starting business. We represent individuals, Dockians, uh, folks who are out of status, who are opening businesses, hiring U.S. workers, and um, and creating value and adding to our economic infrastructure. And unfortunately, I think that our administration is being uh, very short-sighted and cutting off, pardon the expression, but cutting off their nose to spite their face. And we're going to be losing, uh, a, we're, we're losing an international battle. Yes, 